Well, good morning. Welcome to Oasis of Hope Church. If you're visiting or it's been a while, glad to have you with us. <clears throat> if you want to grab your Bibles, we're going to be in Romans chapter 15 this morning. Titled the message, Unity Through Self-Denial. And so if you guys want to turn there to Romans chapter 15 as we continue through the scriptures. Verse 1. If our faith is strong, we should be patient with the Lord's followers <clears throat> whose faith is weak. We should try to please them instead of ourselves. We should think of their good and try to help them by doing what pleases them. So this is... Chapter 15 is a continuation from Romans 14, <clears throat> where Paul instructed those who were strong or mature in their faith not to despise those who were weak. And those who were weak in their faith were not to judge those who were strong. And even from this passage, we know that that's the way it's always going to be in the church. There'll be the weak and there, there will be the strong. And those who are strong in their faith are those who understand the liberty they have in Christ as believers in the new covenant regarding non-essential matters of religion. Oh, I'm sorry. Those, okay, those who are stronger in their faith are those who understand their liberty they have in Christ regarding morally neutral things. For example, whether there are certain days that we shouldn't work or foods that we should restrict ourselves from. Those who are weak in their faith are those who have hesitations, doubts, and weakness of conscience as believers in the new covenant regarding non-essential matters of religion. And those things would include Sabbath keeping, observing ceremonial dietary restrictions, the type of clothing that must be or must not be worn in the assembly of the saints, etc. Now in the church in Rome, as was the case in all of the New Testament churches, it, if not every one, the congregation was com comprised of converts from both Judaism and Gentile paganism. So those were the two main groups that were in the New Testament church, either converts in the Christian church, that, so they were converts from Judaism, or they had come from the pagan religions of their day. And so in coming together from such opposite backgrounds, with whatever traditions and what we could call religious baggage they each brought with them. What principle did the Apostle Paul provide to produce peace and harmony in the church? And so we looked at what he spoke of last week, uh, chapter 14, mutual forbearance. And so mutual forbearance, is he defined it as those who are strong must not show contempt nor despise those with weak spiritual consciences. And those who are weak must not judge those who exercise their freedoms. So that's mutual forbearance. We're not to judge one another, Paul says, because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ where each of us will give an account of not your neighbor what they did. He won't ask you what everybody else did. He's going to talk to you. He's going to talk to me about what we personally did. Therefore, because of that, let us not judge one another anymore, 
but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. And so instead of judging or criticizing, Paul says, what you should really focus on is there something that I'm doing that's a liberty for me that I know would injure, would harm, would trip up, would cause someone to, to stumble or fall. And it would be, I would be without care or concern if I knew. It's like, hey, that's your problem. You just have to watch where you walk. I'm going to do this. Paul says that is not the Christian attitude. Christian attitude is if we know something's going to cause someone to stumble, we should remove that stumbling block. In chapter 14, Paul shares that if we truly love others, we will limit our Christian freedoms if we know that to exercise them in a certain situation would cause others harm. And so that's the loving thing to do if we're mature is we're going to limit our freedom so that we don't hurt somebody else if we know that it's going to do that. Paul shares his own personal convictions about Christian liberties in this way. I know and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus <clears throat> that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat, but if someone believes it's wrong, then for that person, it's wrong. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. Then you will not be criticized for, criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you too. <clears throat> so then, this is he, Paul says, this is what we should aim for in our church and the church at large, the Christian church. Let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Don't tear apart the work of God over something that is non-essential, such as what you eat. And so he's basically saying, is it really worth ruining the work of God by demanding to exercise the liberty that he's given us? Is it really worth tearing apart what he's building? Remember, all foods are acceptable. Everything's acceptable. This is what's wrong. To eat something if it makes another person stumble. <coughs> it's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. When Rod Earls and I traveled to Romania, this was two years ago, we found ourselves in a situation that required navigating the particular non-essentials of the place that we were intended to minister in. Pastor Catalan, who you guys had, many of you had the privilege to meet when he came here, <clears throat> he had scheduled us to share with the church in Suchava on a Wednesday evening at the church. But when he came to pick us up, guess what? He discovered there was a problem. As pastors from the Central Valley of California, neither Rod nor I had packed any suits in our luggage, but only casual clothing. Although Pastor Catalan knew and was convinced that there is nothing spiritual nor unspiritual in wearing a suit, he also understood that for those who consider it to be unspiritual, guess what? It is unspiritual. 
And most likely his church members would be stumbled in trying to take us serious as men of God sharing from his word while dressed so casually. <clears throat> One day when I was out and about, he had some business to take care of at a government office, something concerning, I don't know, real estate, titles, bunch of paperwork. And so I was wandering the halls, just trying to talk to people, finding someone to talk English to. And I was talking to a couple of people, and I told them I was a pastor from California. And we talked, and they were real nice. I came back, and he was like, hey, where were you? I was down the hall talking to these people. You know, I told him I was a, a, a pastor from California. He said, and did they believe you? <laughs> and I was like, I mean, they seem to. They were, they were probably being polite. They were probably fascinated, you know, talking to, to an American from California. But you see, he, he explained with, um, I'm trying to think of the. Uh, it's not the. Uh, it's not the Catholic Church. It's what's the other church over there? Orthodox. Thank you. Thank you. I'm having a brain moment here. So, what they're used to is if you're a priest in the Orthodox Church, you you have. My best explanation is you look like Dumbledore. You have the long robes, a big beard. You have the hat and everything. But anyways, that's what you look like. And you see them walking down the road, they're, and they're like serious people. You don't want to mess with them. You're dressed like that. Or if you're not in the Orthodox, if you're of Protestant Christianity, then you're dressed in a suit, but you're not dressed casually. And so he understood all this. And he, so when he came over, he's like, oh, boy. And he said, you know, he goes, out of all the things, I didn't think I'd have to dress pastors from California. And so... In deference to and respect for the conscience of our Romanian brothers and sisters, we quickly started hunting through the closets of the flat that we were staying in until we found the closest size suits, suit coats, and slacks that we could manage. After a few minutes, Rod, he comes walking into the living room with a pair of pants that were like three times. He's sitting there going like, I don't think this is going to work. A pair of pants, I come walking out, I'm like, I can't get this to button. Maybe we should trade, we'll still not be, probably still won't be right. And so the, you know, the moment was, it was both humorous, it was memorable for all of us, even Pastor Catalan. And when we had found the most suitable clothes that we could find, we came out and we presented ourselves to him for approval. I asked Catalan, well, what do you think? He grinned and told me, you look like Ukrainian refugee. <laughs> and I was like, well, is that going to pass? He's like, yeah, it'll pass. It'll work. It'll work. I think it was even pinstriped. It wasn't my style, but it was the best thing that would fit. Rod even had to borrow a pair of Catalan's dress shoes because all he had brought were a pair of running shoes, sneakers. I, thankfully, I would brought cowboy boots, and it was passable. It's like, yeah, it's kind of like a dress shoe. Okay, I guess you're okay. <clears throat> thankfully, Rod's pants were long enough to carry the white, cover the, the white tube socks. Because when he had this black jet black suit, and he had white dress socks, or not dress socks, tube socks, I was like, oh, my goodness. And then he put on Catalyst's shiny shoes, but luckily they, they covered it so you can can't see it underneath. And so in that situation <laughs> that we found ourselves in, what do you think would have demonstrated the love of Christ and fulfilled the law best? Scolding the brothers for, for being so religious in requiring a certain dress code to be met, to be accepted as a true minister? Or how about if we flaunted our freedom in Christ by dressing in and showing up wearing what made us comfortable. Hey, look, this itchy polyester pinstripe suit that doesn't really fit, that who's, is who's ever in your closet. It doesn't really 
you know, it's not really my, my style. I'm not really comfortable. Would that have demonstrated the love of Christ the most? Or understanding that it was more important for us to conform to their convictions to avoid unnecessarily stumbling our brothers and sisters in Christ. And because we love them and we wanted to be able to share with them freely and without offense, we bore, it was just a minor bit of discomfort in, in wearing those borrowed outfits. When I was a kid and I lived with my grandpa and I would head out the door, he was like, you gonna wear that? I'm like, what? What's, I'm comfortable. And he would tell me, I wouldn't go to a dog fight wearing that. <laughs> that was his way of showing disapproval, but I say that to say, look, I've looked a lot worse, in other words, than wearing, I've looked a lot worse than wearing a borrowed suit that didn't quite fit. It was a minor bit of discomfort for us so that we were free to share. They would take us serious. They wouldn't focus on, you know, our casual clothes. They would listen to the message God had given us. And for the record, before we move on, I don't want you to think that I see myself as strong in the faith and those that we shared with in Romania as weak. I don't want you to think, I don't think that, I'm not looking down like, hey, they're weak, I'm strong. I hold them in very high regard and love. But I share my experience. It's, it's an illustration of how those with different backgrounds and traditions in the church, I'm in the church just as much as they're in the church, but how we ought to accept and treat one another in the body of Christ. It was a simple choice for us when he informed us, hey guys, this will never do. This will probably cause a problem. Why would we want to foolishly assert our right and say, oh, I don't really care. They need to grow up and be mature. That's immature to think that. It would have been immature of us to really, to disrespect them. After all, we're, we're in their country. We're in their church. We're, we're, a, we're a guest. And so we felt the simple solution was just to conform to their convictions, to show respect and love. <clears throat> like Paul, I don't want to take the time to try to share all kinds of multiple examples of possible conflicts between the weak and the strong in the faith. We talked about a couple last week. There's a couple in our passage. But there could be um, X amount, and there, it's always, culture's always shifting. And so the specifics will change, but but the principles don't change. And so instead, as a church, we should address any actual <clears throat> current conflicts. We need to look within and see if we're harboring any contempt or criticism towards anyone else in the fellowship concerning non-essential issues. That's what's important. Not trying to think through history, all the different... We could come up with a big list, I'm sure. But as the Holy Spirit speaks to us as a congregation, are we harboring any of that stuff, either contempt or criticism, towards someone else in a non-essential issue? <clears throat> Excuse me. If we are, rather than first going to the pastor or the deacon or the Sunday school teacher, <clears throat> or somebody else. And why do we usually go to them first anyways instead of talking to the person we're having the issue with? We're trying to get them to agree with us. Get them on our side. Hey, don't you, don't you feel that this is not appropriate? Blah, blah, blah. And we try to get them on our side between whatever's offended us and whatever we're upset by.
But instead of doing that, what should we do? Because that's our natural thing. Try to gain support. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. What we should, we should pray for the person we're upset with. We should seek the scriptures and pray for our own heart and attitude before the Lord. We should go to the other person and share our concerns and love. If we're really upset about it, go. We prayed about it. We sought the scriptures. We're still, still an issue. Go talk to them. Isn't that the biblical principle that Jesus taught us that we should apply in matters like this? By the way, we're not even talking about sin, but the principle still applies if we're offended. Make sure you can go and talk to all your buddies and see if you, you know, they agree with you. That's, that's not the principle of Scripture. Go talk to that person. In our passage today, before, before I get there, one more thing. If someone, here's the other thing, if someone comes to us with a complaint or concern, not about us, about someone else. Ask them if they've, that person, have you prayed about it? Have you sought guidance from the scriptures? Have you tried to go talk to that person and work it out? Don't come to me and talk to me about some issue that you have with them. You go to that person and you talk to them first. Oh, you haven't even talked to them? I'm the wrong person. You sh I thought you were offended at them. Why are you talking to me? What is this about? Have the courage. Do what the Scripture says. And I can almost guarantee you'll probably resolve it before you ever have to even come back and talk to someone else. Go to When you're standing before that person, it's amazing how communication breaks down. Even when you're so sure and you're upset and all this stuff and you talk to them, you're like, you know what, I really like that person. Even though we might disagree, I still love and respect them. They're like, I really love and respect them. If that bothers them, maybe I won't do that. You'll find that they're both, We, if we communicate, we'll find that we try to meet in the middle. And most of the time, we can work it out. It doesn't need to become gossip or going behind someone's back or and especially treating the body of Christ whom Christ died for like that. That's not how we're to treat one another. We should have the respect to go talk to them personally. So in our passage today, Paul <clears throat> continues with the subject of the previous chapter and gives us another principle to guide us in loving one another in the church. Chapter 15, verse 1. Once again, we who are strong in the faith ought to help the weak carry out their weaknesses. We shouldn't please ourselves. Instead, we should all please other believers for their own good in order to build them up in the faith. And so, rather than selfishly asserting our rights in order to please ourselves, the strong should treat their weaker brothers and sisters with kindness and consideration making allowance for their sensitive consciences. Matthew Henry comments, We must bear the infirmities of the weak. We all have our infirmities, but the weak are more subject to them than others. The weak in knowledge or grace, the bruised reed or the smoking flax, we must consider these, not trample upon them, but encourage them and bear with their infirmities. If through weakness they judge and censure us and speak evil of us, we must bear with them, pity them, and not have our affections alienated from them. Alas, it is their weakness. They cannot help it. And thus Christ bore with his weak disciples and apologize for them. But there is more in it. We must also bear their infirmities by sympathizing with them, concerning our, ourselves for them, ministering strength to them, 
as there is occasion. This is bearing one another's burdens. <clears throat> and really, think about that. Think about how much Jesus had to put up with and bear the burdens of the weak disciples. You think he had to put up with a lot and bear with their weakness? They had plenty of weaknesses, plenty, plenty of infirmities of soul, just like we do. We even see Jesus in the Gospels, how long must I bear with you? It's an admission by him. He knew he was. They knew he was. How much? He's like, man, Lord, how much of this can I take, right? But of course he was loving, but he was communicating to them, I am bearing with you. I am putting up with you. I am out of love because I love you. I'm willing to, you know, endure this. <clears throat> and so in our passage, Paul teaches, don't live for self. Live to please your neighbor, to do him good, to build him up in the faith. <clears throat> Matthew Henry imagines how wonderful it would be if we all truly took this to heart and we lived it out. How amiable and comfortable a society would the church of Christ be if Christians would study to please one another, as now we see them commonly industrious to cross and thwart and contradict one another. Right. So he's saying if they were as busy about being kind and bearing with one another as they are trying to undo one another, wow, how nice it would be because we see people always fighting, right? Please his neighbor, not in everything. It's not an unlimited rule, but for his good, especially the good of his soul. Not please him by serving his wicked wills and humoring him in a sinful way or consenting to his enticements or suffering sin upon him. This is a base way of pleasing our neighbor to the ruin of his soul. And so we talked about last week, we're not talking about issues of sin or morality. We're not to bear with sin. We're not to put up with immorality, right? If anyone is overtaken in a sin, you who are spiritual, restore such one in a spirit of love and humility. And then watch yourself that you don't get tempted by the same thing. You don't get taken by what they were taken. So this has nothing to do with, with sin that we're talking about as far as pleasing others. We're not making them comfortable in their sin. If we thus please men, if we make them comfortable in their sin, we are not the servants of Christ. But please Him for His good, not for our own secular good, or to make a prey of him, but for his spiritual good, to edification, that is, not only for his profit, but for the profit of others, to edify the body of Christ, by studying to oblige one another. And now he says something really interesting. He says, the, the closer the stones lie, and the better they are squared to fit one another, the stronger is the building. Aren't we a living temple being built together? Aren't we living stones being placed by God as a temple for a habitation, a dwelling for God? Imagine all these stones are just jumbled together. They don't even want, they don't even want, to, oh, don't touch me. Don't touch me. Oh, I need my space. You know, super drafty, crummy building. The walls look like they're going to cave in. Who would want to be in that kind of building? But think about a building where every... You'll see shows about how in ancient times they expertly quarried and, and made these stones fit so tight that you can't even like get a piece of paper in these joints. It's amazing. They're huge. They're massive. They're super heavy. With their limited tools, how do they do it? It's a wonder and a marvel to see. And by the way, they're still standing to this day thousands of years later. That's what he's saying. The closer the stones lie, the more that we bear with one another in love, 
the better they are squared to fit one another. We rubbed off all the rough edges. The stronger the building. Verse 3. For even Christ did not try to please Himself. But as the Scriptures say, the people who insulted you also insulted Me. As Gail Irwin says, Jesus was the one truly others-centered one who came not to be pleased, but to suffer displeasure that we might be saved. The Bible says that He is our great high priest in the book of Hebrews who is sympathetic to our weaknesses, who was in all points tempted as we are, but never sinned. And yet, He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Concerning Jesus and how He... You want to look at someone who... That's what He's saying. You want to look at this ultimate example of someone who knew how to not live for self, how to attain unity through self-denial, who denied self. Read about what Isaiah said. And then we look in the Gospels. We see it lived out. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from Him. He was despised and we did not esteem Him. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes, we are healed. For even Christ did not please Himself. Henry comments again, This seems to come in as a reason why we should bear the infirmities of the weak. We must not please ourselves, for Christ pleased not Himself. We must bear the infirmities of the weak, for Christ bore the reproaches of those that reproached God. He bore the guilt of sin and the curse for it. And we are only called to bear a little of the trouble of it. Think about how much He bore and then think about the small amount that God is calling us to put up with, to bear, to carry by comparison. He bore the presumptuous sins of the wicked. We are called only to bear the infirmities of the weak. Even Christ, even He who was infinitely happy in the enjoyment of Himself, who needed not us nor our services, even He who thought it it wasn't robbery to be equal with God, who had reason enough to please Himself and no reason to be concerned, much less to be crossed for us, even He pleased not Himself, even He bore our sins. And should not we be humble and self-denying and ready to consider one another who are members of one another? Didn't the cross of Christ take away every excuse that we could ever have? Oh man, you're, that's too much. You're, you're asking me to put up and bear with that? Really? God's asking us to bear a little bit of weakness? Not even sin, weakness. And yet Jesus bore all the sin of the world and did not live in any way to please Himself. He's our example. So how could we, you know, what what excuse do we have? What defense? What argument? How are we going to argue against the example that we've been given? Verse 4. And by the way, that's that's why the Scriptures were given we're told by Paul, 
And the scripture, scriptures were written to teach and encourage us by giving us hope. The things that were written about Jesus concerning his self-denial and sufferings, <coughs> they were written for our learning, for an example for us to strive to imitate. If Christ denied himself, then surely we should deny ourselves. And what is true of the Gospels is true of all the Scriptures. That's why we read the Bible, the whole Bible. They were written to teach and encourage and give the Christian hope. Do you want to know who the one who experiences the greatest patience and comfort in facing trial and tribulation? Who's the one who's has experiences the most patient, who's the most patience, who's the most comforted when they go through trials? The one who has made the scriptures his closest companion. That's what the passage teaches us. The one who has learned the joy of denying self in order to promote unity and harmony in the church. The scriptures are the very thing which give us hope. Who are some of the most hopeless people that we encounter? People who have no understanding of the scripture, no knowledge. They don't give, you know, give it any credence. They reject it. And then they, is it any wonder that they're so hopeless? That they're in despair where it leads them? It's because true hope, it was like Joseph said, we want to be delivered from the storm. But God, how often does He deliver us through the storm? And the deliverance through the storm often comes on our knees in prayer and listening to God's promises and claiming them for ourselves in prayer and tears by ourselves. What's the promise of God for me in this situation? What is the hope that's going to give me the courage, the patience, the comfort that I need to go through this situation. And you, you're standing fast on your knees in prayer with the Bible open before you seeking, seeking God. And then Paul takes a moment after verse 4 there to water his preaching with prayer. Verse 5, God is the one who makes us patient and cheerful. So he says, I pray that he will help you live at peace with each other as you follow Christ. And hopefully when we come here, that's what we experience, peace you know, with one another. We live at peace with each other as we follow Christ. Hopefully your experience is that you don't come to church and you just get so, your blood pressure spikes. I don't even know why I go there or waste my time. Every time I go there, I'm just so, oh. That is totally, that's like, Paul's like, you should never feel that. I pray that God will help you live at peace with each other as you follow Christ. And if you do that, then all of you together will praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That should be the, be the result. We come together as we do. Praise God. That's the experience of this church. And if, if there's tensions that we become aware of, then we, in a godly manner, we address them so that there could be peace and harmony. And we don't, it's not acceptable for us just to let that stuff go on and fester. Whether it's when, within ourselves or we see it in someone else or we, we recognize it, become aware of it in the church. The loving thing God wants us to do, you know, is to address it in love and to use these principles of how to bear with one another and whatever the situation might be. In verse seven, Paul continues to instruct his readers. Honor God by accepting each other as Christ has accepted you. Christ has received us into the closest relationship that we can have with him. He's brought us into the sheepfold. He's our shepherd. He's brought us into his family. He's our father. We've been ado adopted as sons and daughters. He's brought us into a covenant of friendship. God is our friend. The creator of the universe is our friend and most intimate of all into a marriage covenant with himself. Aren't we the bride of Christ? 
And Christ is the, he's the bridegroom who loves us, who gave himself for us. You can't be in more intimate relationship than that. <clears throat> and he has received us. He brought us in that close. Though we're, we were strangers, we were enemies, although we've been prodigals, though we've strayed, he brought us into fellowship and communion with himself. If Christ has received and accepted us in this way, how can we refuse to receive each other in the same way? I'm part of the family, but you're not. I don't know how you got in here. You know, where were they when they were checking credentials? I don't even know how you got in here, buddy, right? If Christ Jesus died for and has accepted both Jew and Gentile into the church, and he did, then what right do we have to draw distinctions and refuse others based on denomination and or secondary issues? Is that what Christ died for so that we can draw up our distinctives, our doctrinal, you know, create some kind of secondary dogma? so that we can make sure we're separate. We're not like you guys, though. We do this. We, we, we understand the true way. That's not why he died, so that we could try to chop up his family. With, you know, with all these secondary issues. Like you said, we're not talking about essential Christian doctrine. Of course, we defend and we draw the line and we stand on that. And if you don't believe those core things, then we you're understood not to be a Christian. We're talking about these secondary. They're not moral. They're not about salvation. They're not essential doctrines. They're secondary things. And how should we treat one another in these secondary issues? Verse 8. And so he gives the... He talks about what God's intention was in bringing everybody together. Verse 8, <clears throat> I tell you that Christ came as a servant of the Jews to show that God has kept the promises he made to their famous ancestors, to the patriarchs, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Christ also came so that the Gentiles would praise God for being kind to them. So he kept the promises to the Jews and he showed his kindness. He kept the kindness that he promised to the Gentiles. He did both. Christ also came so that the Gentiles would praise God for being kind to them. It's just as the Scriptures say, I will tell the nations about you. I will sing praises to your name. Verse 10, the Scriptures also say to the Gentiles, come and celebrate with God's people. Verse 11, again the Scriptures say, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, all you nations, and worship Him. And then Isaiah says, someone from David's family named Jesus will come to power. He will rule the nations and they will put their hope in Him. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about Although the, these were in the Jewish scriptures, they were written, they could read them. They were trying to understand before Messiah ever came, how would this come to pass? What would this look like? They didn't have this understanding or idea of the church as we know the church. And so, how was God going to bring the Gentiles in? So they were trying to understand it. And then when God came, we look back, we look back and we see what he was doing and how he fulfilled it. But now it's flipped because Israel, they were looking forward saying, how is God going to get the Gentiles? What does that mean? All the Gentiles are going to praise God with us. How's that? What's that about? What does that look like? How's that work? But we now it's flipped. We as the Gentiles in the church, we kind of are doing the same thing. We're looking forward because we know that God's not done with Israel. How is God going to save all Israel? How is he going to wind it all? Do you realize we were just like them? 
they were looking ahead, kind of scratching their head. Although it was written in the scriptures, we have scriptures that are not yet fulfilled that we're tr still trying to understand in the same way. But what we know is that God keeps his promises both to the Jew and the Gentile. He already has done it and he will fulfill every promise that he has given. The big issue for us is what kind of unity? So we think of it in two ways. Of course, we think, what kind of unity do we have here in this local church? Is there disunity? Is there disharmony? Are we experiencing the joy that he wants us to enjoy? And by the way, even within this church, how many different denominational backgrounds do you think we've all come from? Okay, and I don't care what the sign on the door or whatever, the whatever. We are Christians saved by Jesus Christ who gave his blood for us. That is what unifies one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Lord of all. And who are we to try to double down on our dogma and debate and divide over secondary issues? That we who are strong ought to bear with the scruples or the weaknesses of the weak and make allowances, even for things that we think are maybe kind of ridiculous. We don't have the right to judge them. We're not their master. We're all going to stand before God. Our job is to bear with one another and bear those burdens and to truly love. And we do it through denying self. We don't demand our rights. There's nothing that's going to divide us quicker than each of us, every single one of us, demanding our full rights. You know, you might win the battle, you're going to lose the war. You're just going to divide. We could probably empty this church in just a few short weeks or months if everyone started just going crazy on their particular brand of weirdness. <laughs> don't sit there and think you don't have some weirdness. I mean, I know that I do, too. And you guys put up with me, and I put up with you, and we kind of, and we're kind of like, Jesus, Lord, how long must I bear with these people at Oasis of Hope Church? <laughs> but we love one another. We, we, we bear with some things that are non-essential, right? Verse 13, Paul closes this section with another prayer. And I think that's a good good way to, close a discussion like this, he wraps up what's been all of 14 and then 15 up to this point. He says, I pray that God, he's the one who gives hope, will bless you with complete happiness and peace because of your faith. And may the power of the Holy Spirit fill you with hope. And that's where our peace, and that's where our hope, our happiness, our joy comes from. It comes from God the Father. It comes from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that He gave us. And I just want to tell you, I love this church and I love, I know um, some of the different doctrinal backgrounds or denominations and stuff that some people come from. And you know what's such a blessing is that those things, you know, they make us unique as individuals, but they don't divide us. And, you know, yeah, it's just like you have X amount of friends that there's lots of topics you don't agree with them on. You know, you have friendly discussions, arguments with them, right, to disagree. And then you laugh and you go, hey, well, we're always going to be on the different side of this issue, but it's not a big deal. Why? Because there's something that supersedes that. That's your love for them. You're like, yeah, but you're a really cool individual. I love you. You're my friend. And this is not a deal breaker. And that's what Paul's talking about. How do we deal with things that are not deal breakers? How we treat treat one another. And so we're not to judge. We're not to criticize. We're not to place stumbling blocks in front of one another if we know that it's going to trip them up. We're to receive them. Not for arguing, arguing, but to build up and edify. 
we're to bear with. If if you're mature, I'm mature. Oh, I'm not a weak Christian. I'm mature. Good. Bear with all the weaknesses of those who are weak. Okay. If you're a strong Christian, that's what you ought to do. Why? Why should you do that? Even Christ Jesus did not live to please Himself. How did He build the church? Through total self-denial. Father, if there is any way, let this cup pass from Me. But if not, not My will, Thy will be done. That's total self-surrender. That's total self-denial. And through that, through His sacrifice, through the denial of self, because He never came to please Himself, He built the church. Through His death, His sacrifice, right, His burial, His resurrection. And that's why we love Him so dearly. And that's why we feel the bond of fellowship with one another. It's in His blood that we have that fellowship. He built unity through total self-denial. That is the Christian way. What right do we have to divide what Christ has united? We don't have the right. We should be so careful before you look down your nose at those Christians and that church and you fill in the blank and whoever you're tempted to look down your nose at or judge, be careful of criticizing the bride of Christ that He died for. You know, He's a jealous God too. He's going to protect his what He's claimed as His own. He's coming back for His church. For the bride. And so, I'm just going to close with this. Otherwise, I'll, I'll run away and you guys will be like, Pastor, stop. But we have, I think it falls really well within the uh, unity nights that we've been doing. And maybe you thought of it. And that's kind of the heartbeat. If you've never been to one, we're having, we're going to host one here June 15th. And it's all different denominations from our little Central Valley here coming together to glorify Jesus Christ. And we're setting aside these things and we're bearing with one another. If if we think it's a weakness, we're bearing with one another in love so that we can celebrate and honor Him and work together in our community to reach the lost. So that's what those unity nights, that's why they're so fun and they're so powerful. We're going to have one here and I would highly recommend you all come out. Joseph, you'll please come up and, and Dana and uh, worship team and uh, close us in a final song. And please, whatever God spoke to you through the Holy Spirit, if, if you have some disharmony, some offense, go talk to that person. Put on your big boy pants. Put on your big girl pants. Be a mature Christian. Go talk to that person. Don't go to someone, oh, so-and-so did this. Just tell them, I don't really care. I'm not so-and-so. Go, please go talk to so and so. Then come back and tell me after you worked it out. We'll have something to celebrate.
Oh, 